Now on to the discussion of the uh, emissions modeling and emissions scenario development. Uh, this piece was led by Josh Miller, uh, co-lead author of this study, uh, who is a researcher at the ICCT, uh, and he will now speak to you all about uh, the various steps that were involved in developing the emissions factors, uh, the emissions inventory, and the emissions scenarios. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Josh to discuss those topics. Josh? Thank you, Ray. If we can go to the next slide. So to start off with a bit of background, um, in the European Union, NOx emissions of diesel cars have actually not really changed in more than 15 years. And by NOx emissions here, I'm referring to real-world emissions averaged over all different types of driving conditions in all new vehicles in the fleet. Um, what we see on this chart is NOx emissions on the y-axis um, shown in milligrams per kilometer, and the emission limits are then shown in the line, so for diesel and gasoline, respectively diesel and, and brown. Now, the key finding here is that even as emission limits have tightened for diesel cars, for example, from 500 milligrams at Euro 3 down to 180 milligrams at Euro 5, emissions have remained at around 800 milligrams per kilometer, and that's averaged, again, over all driving conditions. Uh, whereas most recently with Euro 6 vehicles before the RDE program takes effect, those have achieved on average a 50% reduction in NOx, though the variability in emissions of those vehicles has been very high. Uh, those cars still emit about five to seven times the NOx limit of 80 milligrams per kilometer. And this is all meanwhile that gasoline cars have kept pace with emission limits and they've demonstrated the ability in the real world to meet the limit as have some diesel cars, but on average, diesel cars are still emitting much higher than the limit. Um, this problem does not ex does not uh, is not limited only to the European Union. We've seen high emissions from diesel cars in the U.S., but the reasons for that uh, were more linked to Dieselgate um, than flaws in the regulations uh, or opportunities to improve the compliance and enforcement procedures. Next slide. Um, however, this is not just a light duty. Problem. Uh, it's also a problem with buses and trucks that have had low speed, uh, high excess NOx since 2005. And here we, def we define the, the term excess NOx as anything that is emitted in in use or real world driving conditions um, that is in excess of the certification limit for that vehicle. Um, buses and trucks have, uh, this, this uh, chart shows for a model year 2008 uh, SCR, Selective Catalytic Reduction System equipped Japanese truck, that in low speed conditions, especially below 20 kilometers an hour, real world NOx emissions actually are much higher um, than the certification emissions um, and up to four to five times higher. Now, these are not applicable only to Japanese trucks, but this similar problems have been observed for the Euro 4 and 5 regulations and their equivalents in the US. Next slide. So in order to, to approach the emission inventory development for this study, which covered 11 different regions, uh, multiple vehicle types, and many different standards, we constructed a data set of real world emission factors that is specific to each region, vehicle type, and standard. And that reflects the results of a review of more than 30 emission testing and emission factor uh, modeling studies. This chart shows for passenger cars the resulting emission factor estimates, uh, this time in grams per kilometer. So multiply that by 1,000 if you want the milligrams per kilometer estimate. Um, here we're showing just a snapshot for four regions, China, the European Union, Japan, and the US. And the brown bars show the NOx limits, and then excess NOx is shown in red. And so the total baseline emission factors were uh, our best estimates of what's happening in real world averaged over all driving conditions is shown as the sum of the brown and the red bars. The uncertainty in these estimates is then shown in the um, what, what might look like error bars here. Um, some, some implications unfold from these results for passenger cars. The first is that with Euro 6, we've seen about a 50% reduction on average from the previous levels of Euro 5, which had essentially been unchanged for 15 years. And those findings hold um, not just for the European Union, but countries that have followed similar regulatory pathway and similar compliance and enforcement regimes. Uh, so up until this point, China and Japan have had very similar programs. Um, whereas in the US, what we've seen with tier two standards is a substantial reduction 
and the excess NOx emissions shown there for tier two light duty vehicles, uh, passenger cars in this case, um, light duty category includes light commercial vehicles as well. Uh, but for passenger cars, we've seen high excess NOx emissions in the US with tier two, that's primarily due to the Volkswagen group uh, defeat device vehicles. Whereas in countries that have followed the European pathway, um, notably the European Union, here we see that the excess emissions are actually prevalent across all manufacturers. It's not limited to one, sp one specific manufacturer. Um, looking at the RDE cases here, um, we see that the baseline RDE, this is kind of a worst case scenario in which the RDE program, or the real driving emissions program, doesn't improve past the initial first uh, two regulatory packages that were adopted, um, that have already been adopted. Whereas a strong real driving emissions program includes the third and fourth regulatory packages that have yet to be finalized, as well as additional improvements beyond, uh, beyond those. Um, so really the key finding here with respect to RDE is that in order to achieve levels uh, of emissions in use that are close to the certification limit, we actually need to see continued improvements and modifications to the real driving emissions program, not only in the European Union, but in countries that have followed a similar regulatory approach. Next slide. So on, on the heavy duty side, we took a similar approach in terms of literature review and uh, review of emission modeling studies. Um, but what we needed to do is, is conduct one more step, which is that heavy duty emission limits are based on engine work. So for example, grams per kilowatt hour or um, BHP hour. Um, and the excess NOx emissions in this case then are the difference between the baseline or real world emission factor and the estimated distance based equivalent of the emission limit. And that's done using uh, data on engine efficiency over the regulatory test cycle as well as in use fuel consumption of the vehicles. Um, what we see in terms of uh, NOx emission results is that for heavy duty trucks um, with Euro 3, we still had some excess uh, emissions, but that the total level of excess emissions actually increased to Euro 5, even as the limit tightened. Um, that is in stark contrast to what we've seen from the evidence of emission testing of Euro 6 equivalent or EPA 2010 in the US vehicles that have largely performed very well in the real world. And that's largely, um, especially with the Euro 4, 5, and 6 regulations, um, due to a change from Euro 5 to 6. Um, Euro 6 includes very important provisions for in-service conformity testing that's conducted using portable emissions measurement. And that ensures that emissions in the real world are no more than one and a half times the emissions uh, conducted over the certification test. So next slide. Um, so once we had these emission factor data sets, which also included a data set for buses, um, we combined these with policy scenarios that reflect um, different, different assumptions about the uh, rate of regulatory progress going forward, as well as policies that are in effect now. The baseline scenario is the most intuitive. It's whatever current policies have been adopted and reflects our best estimate of what has happened uh, in the real world. The limit scenario, which is not shown on this table, is the same policies, but um, essentially is a theoretical compliance scenario in which real world emission factors were no greater than certification limits in, in use driving conditions. There are, after that, three new policy scenarios that actually involve um, future policy action. Those are the Euro 6 scenario, the strong real driving emission scenario, and the next generation scenario. Euro 6 essentially uh, assumes that any regions that have yet to adopt Euro 6 standards for heavy duty and light duty vehicles essentially adopt those standards as is within the, the strong real driving emission scenario then builds off of that, assuming that any regions that have yet to adopt real driving emissions programs for, um, for light duty vehicles and that follow the European regulatory approach would then adopt those strong programs and improve the real world performance of light duty diesel cars. The next generation scenario goes a step further, assuming that all regions adopt uh, kind of the next stage of world-class standards, which are assumed to be equivalent to tier three standards for light duty vehicles in the US um, and adopted elsewhere. And for heavy duty vehicles, equivalent in stringency to the voluntary uh, 
NOx program developed by California Air Resource Board. Um, each of those are estimated to achieve approximately a 90% reduction from the previous standards. On the next slide. Now we start to look at the results of the emission inventory. These are totaled across all 11 studied regions. So the limit scenario shows that um, in solid, that's for heavy duty vehicles and the dashed lines are for light duty vehicles. Um, what would have happened if there had been no excess NOx, no real world NOx problem? Um, we would have seen very substantial reductions all the way out to 20, 25, 20, 30 timeframe with some increases after that um, because we're not assuming any further policy action would have, would have taken place. And now in the next slide, um, we add on to that the baseline scenario, which is how things have actually gone. So the best estimate of real world performance of currently adopted standards. And here we see a stark contrast that uh, emissions are much higher, especially for heavy duty vehicles in terms of absolute, um, but that the real world emissions multiplier. So if we divided the baseline emissions by the limits, we'd see higher um, multipliers for light duty vehicles. Um, the reason that light duty vehicles are so much lower here in the aggregate emission inventory is we're only looking at diesel vehicles and the share of, of, of the market for light duty diesel vehicles is high in some regions like the European Union and in India, but very low in other regions like the US where it's less than 1% of the fleet. So the key finding for the baseline scenario here is that at an aggregate level, heavy duty vehicles account for um, nearly 90% of the total diesel NOx emissions, but that in specific regions, light duty diesel NOx emissions are a serious problem. On the next slide, we start to break down that estimate of excess NOx emissions by region and vehicle type. Um, there we go. Um, so the first panel here shows the total excess NOx estimate. So that's in 2015, subtracting the limit scenario from the baseline total. And that's about 4.6 million tons of NOx estimated that was emitted as a result of this real world non-compliance. Um, about three quarters of that excess NOx is on the heavy duty vehicle side, whereas a quarter is for light duty vehicles. Now, if we break down those totals by region, uh, the second panel shows heavy duty excess NOx broken down by region. The five markets that are sort of the largest heavy duty vehicle markets here, China, India, EU, uh, Brazil, and the United States contribute 90% of that heavy duty excess NOx. And that is largely a result of um, problems in the Euro 4 and 5 equivalent regulations, as well as that it's taking time to for the Euro 6 vehicles to account for most of the vehicle activity as they were implemented only within the last several years. Now for light duty vehicles, it's a very different picture because the European Union has had uh, such a high light duty diesel market share and has adopted stringent regulations as in low emission limits that have also had real world compliance problems. Um, we see that the European Union is actually the world leader in excess light duty uh, diesel NOx with about 70% of the excess light duty NOx total. Um, and that's followed by China and India shown in brown and blue here. Um, these three regions together account for the vast majority of excess NOx globally for light duty vehicles on the diesel side. Um, and each of those regions have adopted Euro 6 standards for light duty vehicles, but are at different stages of developing their real driving emission programs and improving their compliance procedures. Uh, next slide. Now we start to look at, at uh, more hopeful scenarios for future policy action. So what can be done uh, about this problem? Um, this slide now adds on in green uh, the assumptions that any countries that haven't yet done so adopt Euro 6 equivalent standards for light and heavy duty vehicles as is. And we find that this has a very substantial uh, effect on the heavy duty emissions trajectory. Um, and light duty vehicles have a similar effect, but not as substantial. And the reason for that is that we're not yet assuming strong rail driving emission programs take effect. The key policy message here with the Euro 6 as is scenario is that Euro 6 heavy duty standards are really the most important action that countries like China, Brazil, Mexico, Russia, and Australia can take. And that in countries that have adopted but not yet implemented those standards like India, uh, that's a really key uh, policy to watch to make sure that implementation is done appropriately. On the next slide, we add in here the strong rail driving emission scenario. This one only applies to light duty vehicles and you'll see that 
uh, that purple line extending out. Um, what this assumes is that real driving emission programs are improved to make sure that they test in-service vehicles, which we'd call in-service conformity testing, that they monitor in-use emissions and cover a broad set of driving conditions in the real driving emissions test to reduce the incidence of defeat devices or poor calibrations and also allow for independent verification um, by other organizations to be able to flag, for example, if there are problems that, um, in the vehicles that are on the road so that there's a regulatory oversight there. Um, what we see in the emissions inventory results is that for particular regions, this makes a huge difference in the light duty diesel NOx emission pathway. In India, a strong rail driving emissions program uh, makes a difference between a fourfold potential light duty diesel NOx increase and roughly stabilized emission levels. On the next slide, uh, the last new policy scenario is next generation standards. These are really the key to steep long-term emission reductions in uh, after the 2025 timeframe. And that's, that corresponds to the timeframe when these standards are assumed to be implemented and it takes several years for them to affect the fleet as a whole. Um, and again, these are based on roughly 90% emission reductions from the Euro 6 equivalent levels. And those policies that, that uh, we can watch the implementation of and model regulations after are the US tier three standards for light duty vehicles and a mandatory version of the voluntary heavy duty NOx rule in California. On the next slide, uh, we'll just reiterate a few of the policy implications before handing off to the next speaker. Uh, the first really is that heavy duty Euro six standards uh, make sense as a priority for any market that has yet to implement those standards. Uh, those are really key to reducing NOx emissions, uh, real world NOx emissions from heavy duty vehicles. For light duty vehicles, Euro 6 standards or, or equivalent or more stringent standards in other regions um, should be accompanied by either strong laboratory based testing as in the US um, or strong real driving emissions programs that rely on PEMS equipment. Um, without strong compliance and enforcement programs, those equivalent standards will not be fully effective and will continue to see high excess NOx uh, in the light duty diesel fleet. The third policy implication is that adopting and enforcing more stringent standards, so beyond your six equivalent levels, could nearly eliminate real world diesel NOx emissions across the 11 markets, but that will take time. Um, to do that, it, there's, it involves lowering the emission limits of those regulations, as well as strengthening the compliance and enforcement procedures to ensure that low real world NOx emissions are achieved in the real world. Um, so with that, I'd like to pass it off to Davin Henze, who will discuss um, where we went from there with the air quality and climate impact modeling. Before you do that, Josh, uh, first I wanted to jump in here and thank you and also pose some questions to you um, that we've been getting now from uh, the participants. We had a question about RDE. Uh, if you could, uh, first I'll, I'll give you the three questions. So on the first question, if you could just go into a little bit more detail to explain for our audience what exactly we modeled as RDE, both in terms of what we consider to be the baseline RDE and all that entails, as well as the strong RDE and all that that entails. And, and if you could also comment on uh, WLTP and the extent to which that's captured at all. Uh, in either of those scenarios. Um, we had a second question about uh, the United States. Uh, if you could just comment briefly on what the policy implications are for the US heavy duty truck sector in particular, perhaps you can comment on the scenarios that we modeled uh, for next gen uh, and what our emission factor findings were for US heavy duty trucks compared to other uh, regions. Um, and then finally, if you could comment about uh, other emission control strategies, um, the scenarios that obviously were assessed in this study were principally around the adoption of new vehicle emission standards. Um, so we had some questions about um, other strategies for diesel NOx control specifically in use strategies such as scrappage programs, their effectiveness, et cetera, um, labeling, consumer awareness, and those kinds of strategies, and possibly even uh, alternative fuels. Um, uh, so those are the three questions. Uh, if you could try to tackle those, uh, that would be great for, for everyone. Sure, happy to do that now, right? 
Um, so to respond to the first question on the definition of the real driving emission program, the baseline and the strong, um, there's a, a detailed discussion in the paper and there's actually a, a paper that um, informed this one. Um, and that one I, I co-authored with Vicente Franco. Um, that one gets into the weeds um, on the definition of what we call in, the, in that other paper, real driving emissions plus A, plus B, plus C. Um, three steps that, that go forward um, from what was adopted um, back in 2016, which we're calling the first and second packages. So what this study does is it essentially takes the, the worst case scenario from that, um, that earlier study, which was published earlier this year. And uh, the estimate is that under the first and second real driving emission packages, we'd see, we, we could continue to see emissions of roughly four times the emission limit. And that's even under the real driving emissions program. Um, the reason for that is that the program in its form as adopted just with the first and second packages does not guarantee that defeat devices will be eliminated from the fleet. Um, it also does not guarantee that diesel cars will have low uh, in use emissions over all the full range of driving conditions, including different altitudes, acceleration, speed, temperature. And so what the strong real driving emissions program assumes is that first of all, there's in-service conformity testing that ensures that these are not just golden cars being tested or cars that were specially prepared by the manufacturer, but they're actual cars that were sold and have been operating uh, on city streets. The uh, second recommendation for that strong real driving emission program is that the conformity factor is tightened from 2.1 to 1.5 over time and eventually 1.2. Um, what that conformity factor does is it, uh, it regulates emissions over the real driving emissions test, um, but we make, uh, we have a, a detailed uh, te technological analysis that is overlaid over that so that we assume the real driving emission test applies over certain driving conditions. First, it applies only to normal driving conditions um, with the next stage of RDE, uh, including cold start, then becomes uh, incorporated under that RDE testing umbrella but there are still extended driving conditions that happen outside of the boundary conditions in RDE. So the strong RDE scenario then also expands those boundary conditions to ensure that vehicles are, are emitting low NOx emissions over the full, um, the full set of reasonably expected uh, driving conditions. So if there are more questions on that, there's a, a follow-up paper, which I'd like to point out um, earlier in the slides on uh, slide 18. And that shows the paper, uh, the link to the paper on um, RDE passenger car NOx impacts in the European Union. Now, the second question for US heavy duty truck sector, what can be done about that? Um, I would touch on, first of all, the, the next generation scenario. We're not showing slides, uh, we're not showing US specific heavy duty results here, but that is included in the paper in terms of the percent change in emissions in that sector uh, with the next generation scenario. And what we find is that, um, that that really makes sense as a priority for new vehicle standards in the United States, that uh, we continue to see a, a, a further development of the new vehicle emission standards. We see a tighter NOx emission limit, and we also see specific changes to the uh, testing procedures that achieve lower real world NOx emissions. So there's some limited evidence that uh, there are some continued problems with low speed emissions uh, well, with low speed conditions resulting in higher uh, NOx emissions. And that results from a, a gap in the test procedure that, that essentially removes any uh, testing data that's below a certain engine load threshold. And so we'd wanna revisit that um, as well as look at tightening the emission limit substantially um, in line with California's voluntary NOx program. Apart from new vehicle standards, though, and that, that leads into the third question, other emission control strategies, there is actually a lot that can be done there, especially for regions that have recently adopted uh, what we're calling um, world-class or Euro 6 equivalent or better standards for both light and heavy-duty vehicles. Those other emission control strategies are a little bit different depending on the vehicle type. Uh, for example, for heavy-duty trucks and buses, um, fleet renewal programs are really important because your six standards have achieved uh, so much better uh, real world uh, NOx emissions and particulate, primary particulate emissions compared to previous standards that accelerated fleet turnover or retrofit requirements on the fine particle side uh, make a lot of sense 
for countries like Brazil, China, India, once they start to implement Euro 6 equivalent standards. Now for light duty diesel vehicles, for example, in the European Union, we've seen that low emission zones have been a very effective strategy to ensure that the whole fleet um, improves over time and that the highest emitting vehicles are not being driven in areas where they're um, creating a lot of pollution that's then, um, that people are exposed to in those densely populated urban areas. So low emission zones are something that we've also touched on in that other paper, the Miller and Franco paper 2017 uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but those could really achieve very quick NOx reductions, especially given transparent and, and clearly defined um, tightening specifications. So requiring that all vehicles, diesel vehicles in certain cities first meet Euro uh, five standards, then six, then real driving emissions, and um, eventually some cities have expressed a desire to ban diesel, which could have very substantial air quality benefits. That leads us into alternative fuels. I would define alternative fuels here with respect to real world NOx emissions as including gasoline, um, additionally hybridization and electrification of those vehicles, as well as biofuels, for example. Um, now biofuels, if, if they're a gasoline equivalent fuel, uh, ethanol, for example, um, can have other types of emissions that can be a problem, and that's not something that we looked at specifically in this study. Uh, for example, volatile organic compounds. Um, but for gasoline equivalent vehicles, at least with respect to NOx, the um, regulations for tier three in the US are, are really um, pushing things forward and we're, we're expecting very substantial NOx reductions that are far lower than what has been demonstrated yet for diesel cars. And so we may see a shift from diesel to gasoline in certain markets, depending on the economics of emission control strategies. Okay. And so with that, I'll leave off. Yeah, great. Thank you, Josh. Um, and thank you for all of those responses. Um, just a reminder for folks who wanna submit questions, please use the questions or the chat bar on the right-hand panel of your screen. And I will be um, uh, selecting a few of those for each of the speakers. Um, maybe just one uh, additional thought to add uh, to your response, Josh, on NU strategies uh, and, and, and to mention a new project the ICT is launching now with the city of Paris and London called the TRUE project that will be uh, undertaking remote sensing of vehicles entering those cities uh, and providing that emissions data to the public. So that gets to one a new, relatively new mechanism by which consumers can be informed about the real world performance of diesel vehicles um, uh, and other strategies like that that can be effective. Um, we'll have to cut it off there. Uh, there will be uh, more information at the end of this webinar that will allow all of you to sort of speak uh, directly to the, the, each of the panelists or give you at least some, some ways in which you can do that. 